Welcome to Between Crossroads. I'm Kaylin Allen, and today we are celebrating Pride with an inspiring roundtable discussion called Beyond the Rainbow. Now, you might be wondering why I chose that name. Well, let me share a little personal reflection. But first, let's add some color to our set. Mmm, very nice. <laughs> See, being queer is an act of courage in itself. We still fight for our existence every day. But it's also important to celebrate how far we've come. The phrase beyond the rainbow is inspired by Judy Garland's iconic song, Over the Rainbow. For many of us, we've reached a place where the skies are blue. And while there's still work to be done, it's crucial to acknowledge and celebrate our journey. Today's discussion is special because it features friends who live at the intersection of diverse and sometimes conflicting identities. We all live at the crossroads of being black, and queer, and each of us navigates other unique crossroads in our personal lives. Joining me are four incredible individuals who are not only part of the LGBTQ plus community, but also living proof that there is hope beyond the rainbow. We have Lindsay Hales, a phenomenal recording artist and Broadway entertainer. Lamont Walker, a talented actor currently starring in Alicia Keys' Hell's Kitchen on Broadway. George M. Johnson, a best-selling author and activist. And Queen Jean, an activist and costume designer whose work speaks volumes. Today's discussion will cover various aspects of queer identity, our journeys growing up, navigating the world as queer adults, and how we find love and build family. We've got a bowl full of questions to guide our conversation. So let's dive in. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining me here at Between Crossroads. You all were specifically chosen by me. So I think, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm calling this episode Beyond the Rainbow because I think, you know, when you're a queer person, especially when you live in the intersectionality of many other different cultures and backgrounds, depending on geographical or any of that, sometimes when we have conversations about pride, they are always talking about the struggle. You know, and I picked all of you because I think even though we may still have our own share of trials and tribulations here and there, we all have made it to a place where the skies are blue mm -hmm. and we have been able to really embrace what that's like to make it over the rainbow. And I wanted people to be able to watch a collective group of people that identify very differently, have different experiences and different coming ups and different ages and different backgrounds to see that no matter where you come from or what you have gone through or what you're going through currently, you can still make it over the rainbow. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a little roundtable discussion. It ain't nothing too crazy, okay? You're just going to pick a little question out of the bowl. You'll answer the question. If anybody else feels like they got something real good to add, then they can add on to it, right? There are also two wild cards in there. So if you pull a wild card, then you can ask any question that you want. Any question? Yes, any question. <laughs> you, you can pick a person or you can say this is for everybody at the table. Okay? okay. Good? Okay. Yes. Y'all yeah. ready? ready? Yeah, let's go. All righty. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. What message would you like to share with young queer individuals who are struggling with their identity? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think personally for me, I think a lot of times as young people, because you are living under a household that somebody else is telling you what to do or call the shots, we always feel as though we have to live our lives for other people. And I think if you are a young queer individual, I think something that's important to realize is that as you get older, there's going to come a point where the only person that you need to really depend on or call on is yourself. And so you have to position yourself to create the world that you want to live in in the future and not so much molding it for the people that are around you in that moment, mm -hmm. the people that you have to ask permission for, for everything, you know? Anybody got any more to add? Self-validation, for mm. sure, which goes along with what you're saying, like not seeking the outside voices to tell you that you're worthy, to tell you that you're good, to tell you that you belong, finding that sense within yourself, you'll be good. Yeah, and I would even say that you also have to be open and that your mm -hmm. gender identity will evolve mm -hmm. as you evolve. Mm -hmm. And so I know like growing up as a young queer person, I, you know, followed a very particular path or one that I thought I should have been following. Mm -hmm. um, but it really wasn't until later in life where I actually began to listen to myself mm -hmm. and had the capacity and the resources to do so and the autonomy that I could uh, begin to explore queen and like the other facets of her that kind of had to 
be suppressed because I was living in my parents' house yes. and they were paying their rent. Yes. So I had to follow <laughs> their rules. And so, but I think that uh, allowing space and, and softness that it's going to evolve because someone else is limited doesn't mean that you have to be limited. Right. Mm. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in Haiti, but mm. then um, my family grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. So Roll Tide. When did you leave Haiti? Uh, I left when I was 10. Okay. So yeah. what was that experience like? growing up in Haiti and being a queer person? Uh, it was definitely um, scary. I mean, but like, only because like I didn't really have a lot of like Judy's or like friends or people that I could really lean on to. And obviously elders. I mean, I think as a lot of us, I mean, whether or not you are assumed queer or could be queer, you know, you're like isolated and kind of like targeted uh, very early on. And so because of that, you don't really have a lot of allies. And the relatives, very seldom, right, do they actually show up and like defend you, protect you, and, um, and, and, and allow you to kind of elevate into the next part of your life. Yeah. But I did. I think that's an important thing too, is finding people who love you regardless, yeah. finding a community of people. I know that it can be hard if you're isolated in a town and part of the world that you may not tangibly see other queer people, but the internet is an amazing tool that you can use to find like-minded spirits, souls, carefully. Careful. Carefully. Finding people that allow you to embrace other parts of yourself um, is an important thing. Absolutely. When I talk to young adults now, it's really teaching them that it's like a journey, like it's a marathon. It's not some sprint and it doesn't end. And I'm always telling them like, I'm still discovering new things about me every year. And so don't think that you'll get to some point and be like, I got it figured out what my identity is. Like you will always run into something that will make you have to question Ooh, yeah, yeah. what your identity <laughs> is and that's okay, right? Like I have been many identities in the last 20 years. Like, and the words keep changing. And the words keep changing. <laughs> yeah. And as we add more pronouns, and I learned from them too because micro pronouns, I remember when they taught that to me at one of my sessions, I was like, I didn't know that we had got past they, them. But now that we have, you know, Zizer, Zim, and M, and like all of these, I'm learning because they're expanding the canon too. And so I think it's important to know that this is a journey and that they can be in control of the journey. I just remember growing up, I was never thinking about like creating language and putting new language in the world. And now that's what I get to do for a living. But I'm watching them do that and be like, none of this fits me, so I'm gonna create something that does. Right. And I think that's what I'm also advocating for them to keep doing that despite society telling you the acronym is getting too big. And I'm like, as black people specifically, we never got to title ourselves. The census called us slaves and octoroons and quadroons. And then now we're like, no, we're black. And that's all queer people are doing too. We gonna keep adding letters until we figure it out. <laughs> And eventually there will be no need for any letters because we can just all live our lives. Yeah. But until we figure it out, we now have that opportunity to title and name ourselves. And that's what I want the youth to keep doing as they keep figuring out new parts of us, keep adding words to it. Yeah. And that you don't have to also just select one, right? That you can be black and queer at the same time, <laughs> yes. black and trans. You know, you can literally be as expansive you know, as we were made to be. Absolutely. We grew up together, you know, both in Kansas City. And since this question is specifically about, you know, children, mm -hmm. who you was as a kid is a very different version of who you are today. It is. I, can you speak a little bit about on that evolution and, and at what point you were like, okay, it's time to step into who I want to be? Mm. I think a lot of that is moving to a city like New York honestly, because growing up, I mean, you were in Kansas City, but I was in like the suburbs right. of Kansas, yeah. white American reality TV suburb type shit. It felt though, like I was true to myself there, that version of myself, right. but with an expanded view of the world and moving to a city like New York where I was inundated with so many things, I was like, oh, like I don't have to be I can allow myself to evolve. I feel like I, I evolved with the container that I was in, I feel. Yeah, I definitely understand that, especially as somebody that also left Kansas and then went to Philadelphia. You were in Pittsburgh, I was in Philly. And I always say, even though I was already very gay, but um, <laughs> once I got to Philly, like seeing the span of it, you know what I mean? Like for instance, I tell people all the time, like, I didn't know what ballroom culture was until I went to college. You know what I mean? That didn't exist in Kansas City. Yeah. But it was like, once I saw what queerness was and, and how it came in so many shapes and sizes, it wasn't even necessarily like, 
ooh, I can be like this, but it was more so I can be whoever I want to be yeah. because all of you get to be that. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. you've had the resources and the access to even see the possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing other people's freedom allows you to then be free yourself. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, that was wonderful. Who want to pull next? I'll go ahead. I'll all go right. Ahead. Let me get over this table. Okay. Okay, it says, how do you see the intersection of your queer identity with the other aspects of your identity, such as race, gender, or culture? As a black queer man, I often say, and this could be contentious, that I'm a black man first. Mm -hmm. And as I walk around the world, my blackness is the first thing people see, the first thing people hear, first thing that um, I present to the world. And as you gain more knowledge, awareness, and information on me, you start to see the different colors of my identity, that I'm from the South, that I am queer, but my blackness is always like the home base. And I guess this makes me want to pose the question to the table. If you had to present yourself in that way, what would you guys say? I proudly identify, I mean, I'm black. Yes. I'm elbow black. Okay, so yeah, but uh, if you know, you know. But I identify as a proud black trans woman and part of that is for safety, right? You have to automatically disclose who you are, but also as a way of, um, in a way of reclamation, but the identity that, you know, a trans woman is, is still a woman, but you know, in certain spaces or um, in different facets, right, you have to identify or put, you know, that I'm trans. I, I find there to be, um, you know, a pause there. I take pause in it sometimes. Like, well, I'm a black woman. I feel black. Yes. Femme, fat. Yes. But they're all parts of who I am. Yes. So I welcome them. I embrace them fully. And it took time to embrace them. One thing that I know about me, I think this is more of like a presentation thing. You know what I mean? Like, I am very flamboyant. I am very feminine, you know? And when I step outside, I am very much that. So oftentimes, I feel like people see that first before they see my blackness, you know what I mean? You're, you're more on the masculine side, you know what I mean? And so like, there's privilege in that because I think, like, you know, people are always talk about how I don't ride the subway, right, or something like that. And, and they always look at it as like, oh, it must be a money thing, or like, oh, Kaylin just, he think he too good for the subway. And it's really not. It's actually the fact that like the majority of time, I want to wear heels. And if I can drive without having to worry about if somebody's going to, like say something to me or look at me a certain way or, you know, be in my face about the way that I'm dressed. Because, you know, I'm gonna come out stepping, you know, I'm gonna be snatched, Every you know time. what I mean? Every then I'm gonna drive, you know? Because I had the option, I had the privilege to choose a safer way of getting somewhere. You know what I mean? And that's why I choose that. So I, I, I think it, it depends. And let me not impose my own thoughts, but I am often, othered from white spaces and white queer spaces. Mm -hmm. And more so like because of my blackness than my queerness, I, I feel othered in those spaces. Is the othering in a way of like, we don't want you here or are they fetishizing you? I, I don't know, I can't presume what they think or why, um, but I know that I feel other, I don't feel as comfortable as when I see my people, mm -hmm. especially if I see my black queer people, then I'm like, okay, I'm real comfortable. But even as a black person, if I see another black person in the space, whether I know them or not, I'm automatically more comfortable. Correct, which, and I agree with that. Even from my point of view, it's not even like a specific space of where like a certain race is or anything like that. It's just like the world as a whole, you know what I mean? It's, it's no different, because that's the case, like that's why I don't like going to the barbershop, and that's a whole other conversation, you know what I mean? And the reason why I asked was like, well, are they fetishizing you? Because you know, anytime that I've been in a, in a, a white queer space, they don't care if you a top bottom or whatever, as long as you black, they want to see what's in your pants. Like at least that's what it felt like to me. Hey, everybody knows me, it's like, I don't like stuff like that. Like, do not come up to me like that, you know what I mean? And that's what my experience has been in spaces like that. We have to come in guarded in, in a lot of spaces as a black queer person. Yeah. 
And so I think part of that guard is like, okay, if I do see someone that is like familiar, I begin to feel more comfortable, but I'm always still on guard. Yeah. Because I'm not like, what I say could be trivialized or my opinion might not really actually be um, respected. Mm. Um, and my experience might not be respected. And so I think in those spaces that um, we just have to be aware. And you know, obviously there's code switching and there's all types of different layers of armor that we have to put on for our survival. I've just come to learn, one, like, when I've had to like teach this, that like blackness is inherently queer. And so because it's already inherently queer, there's no need for me to have to define which one I am first. Wow. Because there is no such thing as blackness without queerness. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at it from like a macro level, black people are the queer, the oddity in this world. That's why every system runs on anti-blackness globally, because we have always been seen as the oddity to other people, right? So that's already being seen as queer to what the norm is in the world. And then from a micro level, like when you get down to the identity of things, if I'm in a room full of black people, why does my blackness even matter at that point, right? If we already all black in here, nobody's looking at that. Furthermore, I'm typically only asked to say that I am black first when it is a black issue going on that is a non-queer issue. Mm -hmm when we need more foot soldiers and want you at the front. But the moment that a queer issue happens or something in queer community happens that also affects black people and I ask for that same reciprocity, it's never there, right? So that is how I know they parse it out in that way and how I can't separate it. Because the moment I try to separate it to benefit the other side, there is no benefit to the separation of it. That's why I just have kind of gotten to this place where I just walk around as who I am. I am a black queer person, I am a queer black person. Whichever one comes first is whichever one comes first, but the two cannot be separated. And I think what also has helped me to kind of get to that space is my lens that I see the world isn't just through blackness and isn't just through queerness. It has to be through both at the same time at all times. Yes. So I've switched the language to inviting in. And that's what I teach the young adults. We're inviting in. And that's something that I believe Darnell Moore coined um, back a couple years ago, but I've been teaching that. Like, we're inviting people into our space. I'm not coming out to you, this is about me. So I actually don't have to choose one because that just is for the benefit of you when you're trying to determine how you best can use me. Yeah. Because if you feel that my queerness is too much, you're not gonna call on me. Mm. But if you feel that, oh, well, you're more mass presenting right now because you got the beard and everything and we know you pro-black, oh yeah, George, you'll work in this space. Yeah. Right, but as soon as we get to queer issues, it's like, oh, 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 if I come in at a certain heel, then it's like, wait, we didn't know you was gonna show up like that. We needed you to show up kind of in your right. mask energy uh -huh. today, not right. your they want you this cookie energy. Cutter. They more, want more you to more house than this. <laughs> <laughs> you ate that, <laughs> but very much so, right? Yes. Yes. And so that's just kind of how I've had to kind of like come to an understanding and come to grips with the whole, are you black first, are you queer first, or whatever. It's like, they so tied together, like you don't have one without the other. What you brought up uh, resonates deeply for me because the lack of reciprocity in our fight. And in particular, I think about um, the uh, young, beautiful angel that was whose life was taken away at a gas station yes. uh, this past summer, yes. O'Shea Sibley. I called him into this space. It was traumatizing, completely heartbreaking that that happened in Brooklyn, New York. Like, what was going on? But like the community that showed up and poured out looked like us at this table. Yeah, it's very. Um, dehumanizing and debilitating to constantly have to, hey, this is our fight too, yeah. right? We have to tap in and wake and shake our neighbors to tap into what is happening, that this crisis actually affects all of us. Like you're wanting us to dim our light, mm -hmm. but our light is still black. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's queer, yes. but you're yeah. ashamed of the queer. queer. Yeah. Yep. Uh, right? Because to like, them, bro, he shouldn't have been dancing in a parking lot to Renaissance. You rap to whoever you want to rap out loud, wherever you want to rap out loud. Like, why, what's the difference? And why does his blackness not worth any, anything now? And that's why I say you can't separate the two. Because how? How? His blackness didn't matter once. Even if it was separated, it's still, this was the thing that then stopped them from showing up to protect his blackness, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's- And would they have stepped in? And, would they and have I think in? that's something that I, I mean, uh, not to derail, but like, yeah, I, no. I, you know, have we in? have conversations a lot with our uh, siblings that like, you know, if we're in a situation in the street where there's chaos and turmoil, right? Can we actually lean on our black brother to step in and be like, yo, 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 get off of shorty. Right, whereas we, we uh, babe, without a doubt, I see a sister being hunt, hemmed up, mushed up. Every time. But yo, bro, back up. 
up. Yes. And it's like, what? Back up! <laughs> you know? I mean, I give them a base with it. And, uh, but, and so there's not that actual knee-jerk care for one another. Yeah. And so I think that is something that uh, obviously is an unlearning. We're inviting people in, but maybe the invitation can only go so, so far. far. Okay. Ooh. That's the difference of coming out versus inviting in. Because if you invite somebody into your house and they disrespect it, that's true. You can come out. I love that. Okay, you can bring yeah. again. Yeah, that's a way better time. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. gives it gives you the agency yeah. that you that we've never had or that like many of our ancestors never had. You know. Yeah. Mm. All right, you need to put that on the shirt. Trademark it. <laughs> okay. uh, what's going on in this bucket chair? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <laughs> we may not have the right. What role does mental health <laughs> play in your life and how do you manage it? I always say, I guess like, cause I get asked this question a lot. And so the first response is Prosecco. Uh, yeah. <laughs> every time we get asked, <laughs> <laughs> okay, having a good glass of wine helps sometimes because like it's really really stressful but no on the real especially being a public figure like it brings a different type of stress and I don't have like millions of followers but I have a really really large impact mm -hmm. and having my name in the news and my book in the news and being attacked by conservatives all day and being called a pedophile and all those things sometimes it does play on you um, but for me I have like things that I do every day to keep me centered. Yeah. So like when I wake up in the morning, I don't check my phone. I always get a cup of coffee. I'm gonna drink my coffee and kind of have like 10 to 15 minutes for myself. I also have an altar set up in my apartment to my grandmother and the deceased mm -hmm. people in my family. So I always talk to them every morning and sit in front of them every morning. I have plants in the house. It gives me something else to take care of that's not myself. Yeah. Yeah. So that also kind of helps. And I go for two to three walks a day. Even if they're quick walks, I just try and walk in sunlight. Uh, all of those things have really helped. And I think the biggest thing that has helped is rest. Like I refuse to work every day of the week. And as a creative, you sometimes feel compelled to do something every single day. I've had to kind of like learn, like I just cannot light the candle at both ends. I cannot pour from an empty cup. Whatever the cliche is, I ain't got it. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to stop. Because it's like, if you don't stop, your body will stop you. Mm -hmm. And I am tired of running into the wall when my body stops me yeah. from doing anything and then me regretting it because I knew I was getting to that point. And so I build in now my schedule, like where at least once every two weeks, I take just a day off because mm -hmm. um, it's just necessary. And like I said, that's just in the work level, but just even from a social level, a personal level, it's just like everything is hard these days. Rent is hard. Dating's hard. Friendships can be hard. Everything can be hard these days because we all going through so much. Yeah. Having a good community, having a great circle of friends, having people you can call on at any time in the morning or night. People who just text you to say, hey, you are on my spirit. How are you? I'm very big on that. If I think about a person, I'll just text them. It means so much to the other person sometimes because yeah. we never know. There are some people who go a whole day without getting a text from anybody to check on them. Wow. who will be asked to do labor before they are asked how they are. Ooh, and I am very big on the how are you. When I ask how are you, I really mean that. When people ask how I am, I'm going to tell them the truth. So don't ask me unless you really want to know. My internal world, what's going on in my mind, I've realized the older I get, totally affects my external. Like anything that's going on here is going to be projected outwards. So meditation like has saved my life. Mm. That's my practice daily waking up before I do anything, sitting with myself in my mind, clearing. Like I don't listen to like music or like do mantras. I just literally listen to the sound of the AC, let my mind clear. When I approach the day or anything I have to do from that space, like that was a game changer for mm -hmm. me. I love that. I've gotten into a habit of going to the gym and I know that this could be cliche, but it really has transformed my entire day yeah. by waking up and actively doing something that daily, weekly, monthly, you can see a progression. It's mental because you have to be present and aware. It's physical, it's emotional, and not for external validation, but for internal validation, you feel stronger physically and emotionally just by knowing that you show up for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's how I really have been able to ground myself when I don't go to the gym, a day I don't go, I am completely out of whack. Who, which one of y'all want to pull first? Wow. 
Have your experiences with love and dating shaped your identity and self-perception? Ooh, that is deep. We jump in. Woo! Okay. Um, I was about to say, dive in it. But no. Um, my experiences with dating, yeah, this is, ooh. Go ahead in, go ahead in, go ahead in. Lean into okay. it, lean into it. I feel that in this moment, I am actively fighting to like um, push out the negativity and allow space for true love to hold and to like take up space. In terms of dating with, you know, as a black trans person, yeah, it's the key. Um, I have been very um, transformed in my mind uh, I think growing up, I, I still to this day, you know, I'm like, I'm a queen sitting on her throne waiting for a king. And so I'm, I'm excited about that pursuit, but I don't want to be limited by it because knowing that like love can take shape in, in any different way. Um, but I want to still hold truth that whoever I'm loving or holding space for, inviting into my, you know, into my being, that they respect me. And that cannot be like compromised. You know, it's so hard. You want to go home and have somebody rub on your booty. Yes. So, you know, or just somebody, you know, just to be mindful and to be compassionate and who thinks about you, yeah. right? Who considers you even. And so those are the things that are truly powerful and, and essential. And I'll say my experiences so far, I'm still working on them. I'm trying to date more. Um, I'm open. I'm trying to actually really define, well, what is it that I really like? The person I am now uh, is definitely more excited about meeting new people. Yeah, I think that's it. And then self-perception, I know I'm the best. And so I know that what I'm bringing to the table um, is something that's truly genuine and um, you know can't really be um, downplayed. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Initially, I guess for me, love blocked me from being myself because desirability politics and the politics of just how we have to exist within black community, queer community, who gets seen as desirable, who doesn't, what factors go into that based on fat phobia, colorism, femme phobia, and all of those things. You start to try to make yourself in the best image of what you think you're trying to pursue of the person you've created in your head. And so for me, it was one, destroying the person that I created in my head that I thought I was supposed to be attracted to. Two, it was then leaning more into, well, who do I want to be? I do identify as non-binary because I've always been kind of in between this, this thing and this thing and not really a thing at all, I guess you could say. Uh, and my grandmother told me that. So and she was a church lady and told me like, you was never a boy and you was never a girl. You just kind of was in the middle. Well, damn, you always seen it. Like, why can't I see this in myself, right? Why was I so scared to be this thing? But part of being scared to be that too was like, the people who are in our dating pool, they got issues with pronouns. The people who are in our dating pool got issues with us wearing makeup and wearing heels and doing these things. Yeah. And so I would make myself have issues with those things because these are the people who I found attractive, let's say. In doing that, it was denying me who I truly was. I've learned that like me being my full self has brought me some of the best uh, romantic experiences that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And so like, I am still very close to people who I've dated and we just key and it's still all love. And maybe in the future it will be a thing because there is also a side of me that has to have grace for anyone who I date because I am a public figure. I do publicly live with HIV. I am in the public eye and everybody doesn't desire that even if they desire you. And I also don't want you to be my secret because when I walk on a red carpet, I expect you to walk out there with me. <laughs> and my life, as it continues to grow, will only be more of a spotlight on me and whoever I am with. And yeah. you will fall under the same scrutiny that I fall under. That's a lot for anybody to take in. So I come from it from that space of having a lot of grace for anybody who is even willing to be like, I'm going to take on this challenge of dating you. And also having a lot of grace for myself as this not having to be a goal for now. Like yeah. I am actively dating, but also maybe my marriage isn't supposed to happen until I'm 50. That's okay. Maybe it's never supposed to happen. Maybe I become the possibility model of a single life that's also been very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. I guess like the more that I just trust in the universe and trust in my spirituality, trust in the ancestors, it's like, that's okay. Like I can be that possibility model too. Like in the possibility model of love doesn't have to look like marriage. It can look like straight up partnership. It can look yeah. like, for those who like it, polyamory. It can look like multiple things. Like, especially when you're talking about the desirability 
politics of it all. Like that's a whole nother episode that we could dive into about how, especially for those of us that are othered, you know, and and even within the community, you know, and how that also plays a role in it. But to that point, for the next call. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, you know how people reacted when they saw Don Lemon coming out of that church yeah. with them puppies. <laughs> with them puppies. What unique challenges have you faced in dating, and how have you overcome them? Ooh. Come on, Lindsay, tell the story. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Come on, the gospel. I would say something the past over the past year, few months that I've run into is how I'm perceived and how I they how the other person thinks that I need to show up in a relationship. Oh, so being perceived okay. as maybe someone who's more masculine, which I don't feel personally. I, like I feel when I'm dressed how someone else would perceive as masculine, I feel so feminine because I'm a girl and I feel so girly all the time. So in dating, people perceive that, whether it's on social media, if someone's sliding in the DMs, will connect there, get in person, and then it's like, you need to do this, you need to be opening doors, you're the masculine one. I'm like, no, treat me like a girl. Like, I am a girl, I'm a girl. And how I would like to show up in softness and in femininity and being held and being a little spoon and the challenge of the other person being like, oh, but, you know. I expect you to be I expect this. you to be this because of how, how I perceive your being type. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. Those that know me personally, I am, very overly independent, and I'm also very nurturing. And I think the challenges that I have faced is that often it feels like people just like the experience of me. They like for me to take care of them, to make them feel good, to lift them up, to, to make them feel cared for. Because I think, I think people know that they can trust me, you know? I think I am very much, what you see is what you get, and you don't have to question that. And I think that creates a world of safety for them that they don't get anywhere else. But the problem with that is what ends up happening, at least in my experience, is that it often feels like I'm doing all the pouring into and I'm doing all the taking care of, and then I get deserted, mainly because, and this is where the responsibility comes to me, is because in reality, I don't need it, if that makes sense. I don't. I know how to take care of myself. I can do that. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to sometimes feel like I don't have to. The one thing that I feel like no man has ever done is no one's ever asked me what I needed. You know, everyone's always assumed or come with their own perception of, of what they think they, they should be doing for me because they're so used to using or dealing with people that can't do for themselves. You know what I mean? But then you get somebody that is the 360 and well-rounded and can do it all, and you don't know how to approach that. And instead of just asking to figure it out, you just don't do anything at all. And then I'm left becoming resentful. Do you take the moment to say, hey, I'm meeting you, this is my name, these are the things that I need? And not in a like, here I am, but in a way of like, we're being open about possibly developing something, let me ask you what you need, and then I'm gonna tell you what I might need. Mm. Well, my question then is, <laughs> okay, yeah. my question then is, do you think that I do that? Uh, <laughs> no, okay. no, no. Which is valid, but, but let's be clear. Let's rewind. Clearly, you know, we've had our past. 